All right, welcome to the Krug Show. Hope everybody's having a great night. It is March the 26th, 11 minutes after 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. on the West Coast. That means it's 11 minutes after 11 back east. And welcome to the Krug Show. Brought to you by Pig and a Pickle, the best barbecue in all of Northern California. Check them out in Emeryville and Corte Madera. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. till 8 p.m. Or until they run out, pig and a pickle, go say hi to Damon and Mary. Tell them that Larry Kruger sent you. We're also brought to you by Marin Auto Glass. MarinAutoGlass.com on the web. 415-883-3030. Underdog Fantasy. Hit that link in the description. Use the promo code Krug, K-R-U-E-G, and they'll match you up to your first $100. And Sharp Corner Sports Cards and Collectibles. In Pacific Grove, call Anthony Catania. He's at 831-521-5264. All right, we get it rolling on a Tuesday night. Warriors just played and beat Miami. Giants and A's playing the final practice league game. The Orlando NFL owners meetings were held earlier today. We're going to get into that. But before we do, um, you're looking at two guys who are losing right now Raj and RSF 49ers are losing to Croc and me unbelievably I cannot I can't believe that I'm losing but I'm losing to a guy uh, who's created this pool I guess I shouldn't be that surprised that the guy who's created the pool is beating me Um, but Rob stats Carrera is beating me by about 25 votes so I put the link in the description if you're a Krug Show fan, if you're a Krug Show regular, do me a solid. Hit that link in the description and vote for me and hopefully push me over the top against Rob Stats Guerrera. Um, and I, I think I should beat Stats. I really, I, I mean, if, the, if everything is right with the world, when you look at how many people follow me on Twitter, how many people follow me on YouTube, compared to how many people follow him on Twitter, how many people follow him on YouTube. Um, I should beat Stats Carrera, but I am da- I was down a point earlier today, and now I'm being told by Raj I'm down like 20, 25, maybe even 30. So yeah. I need everybody in the stream to just take, take a chance uh, and go over the links in the description and just vote. Vote for, uh, vote for, your, vote for your guy here. Um, does it mean anything to me? It probably shouldn't, but maybe it kind of does. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I kind of want to win. I'm like the kind of guy that wants to win anything I play at, you know? So, um, please vote early, vote often, vote for Raj over Croc, vote for me over the man who created this illegitimate, uh, pool that has him beating me. Uh, go vote in this illegitimate pool. Um, and the link is in the description. Please vote. Vote early. Vote often. Tell a friend. Vote, 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 and then vote some more. Uh, Raj, good to see you, man. How are you? How was your um, How was your Tuesday? I'm good. It was a busy day, but I, I was good until we saw the, you know, we, we pulled up the stats there, and uh, I'm losing, man. I, I, I know it doesn't mean much, but I want to win this thing. So please vote for Larry. Vote for me. Let's get us in the Elite Eight. Let's go neck and neck. If I lose to Larry, I'll be happy. Okay. But let's, let's get me to that point. So please. If, vote if, for your we, boy. if we both win, do we face each other next? Is that I, how I it think looks? We're, we'd be in, we're in the same region. So eventually we play each other. Yeah. See, it doesn't bother me to vote to lose to Raj, but it does Dang. bother me to lose to Stat. Uh, because, you know, Raj is a force of nature. Uh, Stat I guess not. is somebody that I should be beating. You know, Croc, I, I, Croc, though, I I get it. Croc won last year. Everybody loves Croc. He's a good guy. So it is yeah. what it is. So. All right. But vote. Vote for us, please. Please vote for us. Uh, Jimmy Perez says, Larry, what's up, man? <laughs> Jimmy, what's up is I'm losing to a guy named Stats who, who's covering the Niners from thousands of miles away. Well, I'm there at the facility interviewing the players interviewing Steve Young, interviewing the key figures, I'm getting beat by a guy who right now is getting ready for bed. <laughs> right? And and I'm going to be up for several more hours. 
So what's up? What's up if I'm losing to a guy who's brushing his teeth right now and, and getting ready to lay his head on his pillow? And I got three more hours of grinding, three more hours of Niners and Jed and you know Kyle and who said what, and maybe a mock draft. I could have a mock draft before I go to bed. This guy's on his way to bed. I, I could do seven rounds of a mock draft between now and bed. I could do multiple mock drafts. That's what's up. All right. Uh, I mean, he knows I'm just joking. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you to everybody who voted for me. Jesse says Brad Graham is the goat. Oh, my God. Just leave here right now. Just have, Jesse, just, just jump out. If Brad's going to be the goat, then just jump out. Uh, Class Limperio. Where's the link, Larry? We can't find it. Kev said he linked it in the description. Raj, can you see in, in your wisdom? Is it linked in the description? I don't see it on, on there, but um, uh -oh. I don't have the browser open like everybody else does. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Kev said it for 8.30. Oh. Maybe that's the problem. Could be why. Could be why. It's on the gold standard network. I know that. Come on, Kev. Where's the link to the vote? I need it now. There we go. My guys need to vote. They need to vote now. All right. <laughs> Larry is so humble. Yes. I mean, come on. Vote for Raj all day, every day. But, I mean, throw a vote to, to me. I mean, I mean, I'm literally... I'm I'm nine four five nine eight. I know. I'm out here. I'm out here west. Who's at training camp every day? Who's who went to the Super Bowl? Who interviewed Steve Young? Who brings you face to face Niner interviews? Me. Come on, vote for me. Um, I asked Kev. I said, "Where's the link to the vote? I need it now." He says, "Okay, wait." Oh, now I got to wait. Floyd the Barber says, Larry, you have my vote. Have you scouted Christian Haynes? Yes. You, University of Connecticut guard. In fact, I was there when Haynes squared off against, I think it was the LSU uh, defensive tackle in the East West, in the uh, Senior Bowl practices. And there was a big old brawl. And Haynes, Haynes handled himself well. He didn't talk a lot of mess. You know, um, I like Christian Haynes, very strong guard, can get out and run, can get out and run block. Um, that would be a really nice, maybe not a first round pick, but more of a second. He's more of a second than a first round pick for sure. Ian Sharp says more begging vote for Raj and vote for me. I mean, come on, vote early, vote often. We've got this one, Jonathan Santiago. Larry, you got my vote. Thank you. Thank you. What about Raj? Marcus Harris says, you're the man, Larry. I, I could be the man, but I would be better if I had your vote. I don't want your I don't want your your money. I don't want your patronage. I want your vote. All right. No, I'm just joking. But please don't let me lose to a guy named Stats. I mean, it would it would do me. It would do me wrong. I mean, it would, it would, I would sit there, it would make me, it would put me in a bad mood. Um, <laughs> we get this one. T Dub says, Larry, link now. I'm not voting. Link now or I'm not voting. Oh, man. Look at this. Steve, Steve uh, Michael says, Larry, you're the man. Been listening to you since before Sports Phone 680 with Larry Kruger. Wow. Oh, my gosh. How old is that? That goes back to, 1997. Oh, Where were you in 1997? 13 years old in, uh, was it middle school? I've been doing this since you were 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Middle uh, school. T-Dub -T says, need the link, Larry. Oh, my God. How do I vote? Oh, I'm telling Kev. Lots and lots of people want to vote, but can't. Oh. Uh, because of you. 
because of your negligence, Kev. He's like, relax, relax. Relaxing didn't do it for, you know, in any election. You got to stuff the box. You got to, you know, 2,000 mules or whatever. You just got to just, just, just keep voting. Like Cook County. Um, all right. Uh, it says T Dub says JK already put in 200 votes for Larry. I don't know. I, I'm not. I, I think that I'm not sure if you can vote that or, that often. Um, David Musechek says Kevin wants somebody else to win. Oh, mm-hmm. isn't that? Look at that. Is that possible? Maybe he wants. Oh, look at this, Kenny Forty Nine er clip. Kev really screwed the pooch on this one. He did. Ian Sharp. Did. Kev's in the doghouse. Oh, oh, he's in that Brandon Ayuk doghouse. My God. Um, Kev says you can also look it up yourselves. It's a website. Oh, come on. Gold you standard said... network, the gold standard Niners, gold standard Niners.com. Uh, gold standard Niners.com. Here, I'll yeah, type it in. Gold, standard, gold Niners. standard Niners.com. Is that it? That's, that's all. It. That's it. Now, Raj, do you remember how far you went last time? Last time I wasn't in the tournament, so I'm a lot farther than I was last time. <laughs> gold standard Niners or gold standard four nine or ERS? Gold standard Niners. And I am. Mm-hmm. I'm on it right now. Look at that. All right. Gold standard Niners.com. I put it in the chat, everybody. Please vote for your boy. Do not let me lose to a guy whose name is Stats. All right, um, Raj, uh, Jed talked today and said some interesting things. Why don't we start mm-hmm. right there? Let's do it. Um, you know, I thought it was, you know, it's funny. He said that he didn't think it was a primary, a pri- you know, didn't, didn't think it, it was a big deal that he became the mm-hmm. primary owner today. What do you think? Is it a big deal that Jed's the primary owner? I think he played it down. I think that's a big deal. I mean, primary owner is a big deal in my my end. I mean, I guess he really typically cut and was like the owner, but now he's the principal owner. He has the title. Like he was the CEO before, obviously, but he was doing the owner type stuff. I think it is a big deal. I love it for him. Um, Jed's come a long way <laughs> uh, with with you know being front office guy on this team, CEO, and now owner and everything. When he first came in, you know, it looked like things were gonna go good. And then, you know, the, the whole Trambalki situation, Harbaugh issue and all that kind of made him look bad and nobody wanted him. But it it, it kind of started getting down to like a really boiling point to him. And I think he realized he was on the hot seat and I think he was, like, OK, I got to choose greatness over my friends and, and get the right people in there. And I think, again, he's kind of righted his wrongs. He had to fire his friend. And that was a big decision for him. Mm-hmm. Got rid of those coaches that weren't winning. And he's brought along Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch, and they've really turned this program around. They've become, you know, uh, perennial contenders. I know they haven't got it done all the way, but they've become so close. I think this is big for Jed, and I, I, I like that for him. I think this was a huge deal for him, but, you know, I like that he downplayed it. He's a little humble, so I like it. Um, you know, I mean, I, to me, it's it was, it was a fait accompli. I mean, right, I mean, what, are they going to give the ownership to somebody else? I mean, they're going to keep it in the family. It's an incredible asset. Why would you ever walk away from the NFL? The one thing you don't see a lot of is you don't see a lot of NFL teams being for sale. Why is that? Because it's too profitable and it's growing at such a rate that very few uh, owners are going to want to sell unless somebody dies or there's some other issue in the family. So I never expected them to move on from Jed. I expected Jed to you know, get this role as the, as the lead owner. what do you think of Grant's question? Grant was like, Hey, you know, originally, you know, in the Harbaugh era, you're tweeting out, you know, we judge ourselves on Lombardi trophies. And now you're saying you're happy with losing to the lions in the NFC championship game. And Jed's answer was, you know, you can't be ashamed of successful seasons. What do you think? Do the, should Jed have higher standards than he does currently? I think he does have high standards, but I think he also realized 
it's hard to get all the way to a championship game. Like, I'm sure they all wanted to win a Super Bowl. You know, a couple years ago, he had that speech in the locker room when his brother passed and, you know, he cried and broke down. He says, one of these days we're going to be holding a championship. You know he wants to win a title. You know this family has been trying to chase that ring. You know, back in the day, they were getting Lombardis. And I think he still has that same, you know, mentality of the standard is you need a winner Lombardi. I think the whole team does. But it's not easy, Larry, these days to get to the top of the mountain. And they've been so close so many times. But the fact that they have gotten to that point, it's it's not easy. Like, it's it, they're, like, on the cusp of being a dynasty. But obviously, you can't until you win a Super Bowl. Of course, they need to have high standards of winning a Super Bowl. I don't think they're happy with losing the Super Bowl. But the fact that they're getting close, I think it's something to, you know, be happy and cheer for as a fan. You know, I'm not happy that they lost the Super Bowl, but it's been great, you know, um, you know, getting to that point and seeing the journey because I'd rather them get down to a NFC Championship game or a Super Bowl than five win season and being a crappy team. We were there. We were there for many years when they were like a it was a dark cloud hanging over his team. It's like, oh man. I mean, to his point, like, yeah, it's nice to win every year, but there is more that needs to be done. They do need to win a Super Bowl. The standards need to be high. So I saw it both ways, honestly. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with um really anything Jed has said as far as you can't be as a fan, you can be in this, you know, um ecstasy agony kind of lane that's fine but when you when you're the owner when you're in the organization itself there's too many man hours invested there's too many people's jobs on the line there's too many there's just too many there's the the investment is so sizable when it comes to hours committed to trying to win that if you make it to you know, there's 32 teams in the league and you're better than 31 of them. You can't sit there and be like, it's failure. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just, I know it's, you want to have high standards and, uh, but you just can't have high standards. The only thing I will say is that, you know, I didn't like hearing Jed, you know, say a bunch of things like, you know, well, in Eddie D's day, they didn't have this and they didn't have that. It's like, that's a, that's a slippery slope as well. Eddie D won his rings. Let's not besmirch him in any way. Let's not try to make it seem like his accomplishment was any less mm-hmm. um, just because it didn't come during the salary cap era. I think that's yeah. where if I was Jed, I think I would have shut up, but I'm not, I get no problem with Jed saying, Hey, it was a good year. It was a good year. And then, you know, he's talking about it in the context of his 11 year old. Who's like, you know, in tears and it's like, yeah, you got to be the adult. You know, you got to be the guy who says, Hey, you know what? Yeah, we lost and it hurts, but it's all right. We'll get them next time. Sometimes you got to be that person in your family. Um, if you're there with your 11 year old. So I think that has a lot to do with his standards as well. I don't think his standards are lower or like, Oh, we don't really care about winning a super bowl. I think he desperately wants to win a super bowl, but I think he understands that you're not just going to rip the whole thing to shreds and tear it down and fire Shanahan and fire Lynch because you don't make it to your ultimate goal in the 2023 season. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's, that's my take on it. No, absolutely. They've gotten, again, they've gotten so close. It's like, what do they need to get over the hump? And now we're sitting there like, okay, we've added this. They add players to this roster every year it's not like they don't want to compete it's not like they don't want to win a championship i think everybody's goal should be to win a championship right but some teams are just trying to make it to the playoffs or, or win the division the niners their goal is to win a super bowl and they've gotten so close um but yeah unfortunately one team is going to win it all and the rest of them end in a painful heartache and some some heartache is more if you get closer to the end which the 49ers typically do and it's it's painful i get it but to say that they don't have high standards, I think that's the crazy point. And, and I think everything he said was was great, and I think it was right. But I do agree with you in the sense of you can't belittle the old days because a lot of people do. Like, well, it's harder these days to win. It might be, but it was also difficult to win back then because, you know, the league hit the, – there wasn't a lot of rules with, you know, defense can't do this, defense can't do – you can't touch the quarterback. You were hitting guys like crazy back then, so it was hard to win. In those days but yes the salary cap has changed the complexity of the game but there's two different eras it's so hard to compete you know compare 
it's just like whenever people say, well, is this guy the GOAT? Is this guy the GOAT? You know, it's sometimes it's hard to compare the eras, but I think you should respect every champion in every era for what they were in that time. Because at that moment in time, they were the greatest. But then in another era, somebody else is the greatest. So it's tough to compare. I think Jed should have just said, you know what? Eddie D was amazing because he did great. And guess what? They won Super Bowls back then. Niners haven't. So you can't sit there and bring his down just to make yourself feel better by not winning. Because guess what? Those Super Bowl championships, you can't take them away. So Well, and the fans are, you know, it just makes you look small. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I'd like to have nine defensive tackles. I'd like to have better backups. I'd like to have, you know, it's like, okay, you know, let's just – Let's give Eddie his and let's hope for the best in this era. Um, you know, I think it's interesting too. Um, I, I Jed says a lot of things that are very, that are very true. I mean, um, he says that you have to build through the draft. He, he admitted that the Niners got lucky with Brock Purdy. Yeah. Um, he says, you got to build the team through your, through the draft. He says, I'd rather pay guys that we draft and develop than overpay in free agency. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's, that is the right and correct mindset to have if you're building a Super Bowl champion. So I like that he's at least, you know, he's in reality. Um, and I, I agree with what he said there. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I agree. And I think the Niners have been showcasing they've done that. They've drafted so good. And they typically pay their stars that they've developed through the draft. Kittle, Debo, Bosa, Warner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now you the next one. And they typically, if they draft a guy and he becomes a star in the league, they're going to pay him. And that's the way to do it. You know, it's a homegrown system. You got, it's like a farm system. And that's what they do. They get homegrown talent. They go out, they scout these guys. They can save some money for a few years while they develop. And then boom, now we got to pay this guy because he really worked hard for that reward. And he, he stuck it through. And look, now we're going to reward him by saying, hey, look, you put in the work. You showed us you could be great. Now we're going to pay you because you were great for us. And that's our token of appreciation. So I love the way that the Niners build their team. And again, most of their guys are through the draft. I mean, yeah, they're going to get some free agents here and there, but they're not wasting their money on guys. They get, they make it smart, um, you know, and tactical when they do get free agents. I think they do a very good job of getting guys that fit their system and they're not going to break the bank. I mean, there's a few times where they go and make a splash and that's exciting. You know, Hargrave, that was exciting. CMC, the trade. You know, and if they need to, they'll go and upgrade the roster. A couple of years ago, Emmanuel Sanders, that was fan, that was fun to see. But overall, I do love the way that the Niners built through the draft. And I think this is the right way. But it's not always something that teams can do. You have to be able to be really good at scouting and drafting. And they've developed a good front office. They've developed a good coaching staff that can develop that talent. Chris Kasurik, one of them, though, you know. And as we've seen over the years, all those good front office members and all those good coaching members – they're around the league. They're all over the league, Larry. Look, look around. There's free. There's head coaches. There's GMs that used to be on the Niners all over the league. You saw the pictures, right, at the owners' meeting and, the you know, all the pictures. Most of those guys were Niners before. It's crazy. So, yeah, Niners do it the right way. A um, couple supers here. Ch uh, Kles Lumperia, where's the link, Larry? We can't find it. It's in there now. Kev has put it in. Class also says, what do you guys think of Jed's comments about Eddie D winning without a salary cap? Uh, Jesse kind of thought he was taking shots at his uncle. Well, as Raj and I are talking about here, it's like, it's, it's, and where are you going with that? You know, it's like, where are you going with that? You, at the end of the day, what are we discrediting championships that the franchise has? Come on. I mean, uh, you know, um, I, 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 pr I could have done without those comments to be yeah, honest. I didn't like it. Um, one of the questions I thought was kind of interesting, or one of the comments from Jed, he says it's a good problem that Brock will be the highest paid 49er at some point next year and, and one of the highest paid players in the NFL. And then Jed, Jed said Brock has a chance to be an all-time great quarterback um, in the years ahead. I agree with that, but some people would say that's controversial. What do you think? I don't think so. If he has another season like he did last year, he's going to get paid accordingly it makes sense you know he's going to be on the um he's going to be on that that year to earn his money and again if he has a second season of starting and puts up similar numbers or better than what he did last year in his first year of starting he was mvp candidate until the the christmas game against the ravens he was nfl fedex 
you know, player of the year. He set a franchise record in passing yards. It, it's not a bad statement. I just feel like people are still going to, you know, underrate Purdy. They still don't think he's good because of the weapons on the team. He'll never live that down until he pro- until he wins a Super Bowl. Or But but the people will still hate on Purdy. No matter what, Purdy always has to prove himself because he was the last pick of the draft. And, oh, he's only be good because of this. He's only good because of this player. And da-da-da-da-da. But absolutely, if he has another season like he just did, Larry, he's going to get paid a lot of money from the 49ers. They found their franchise guy. They talk about him very highly every single chance they get. Jed does. Uh, John Lynch does. Kyle Shanahan, the players do. It's not just lip service. They they see it. They see what they have. They're blessed. Like they said, they got lucky to get this guy because they made so many mistakes in the quarterback front. Like We've sat here for years crying about quarterback, and now we finally – have the franchise quarterback. As long as it can stay healthy, we're good. And last year he was coming off of a, you know, the the UCL tear and all that. He was rehabbing. This offseason he doesn't have to rehab, Larry. He's going to get better this offseason. He's going to be training, making himself better instead of having to work from coming off of the surgery. So, I think it was a a fair statement and I think he's going to get paid handsomely. Um Shanahan spoke today and he spoke for quite a while. I mean, I was uh, it was like probably it seemed like 45 minutes he was just talking and talking and talking. Um what was your primary takeaway from Shanahan? Anything that he said today um you know surprise you or you find interesting? Nothing surprising. I think most of the stuff that he said kind of um was what I was thinking and same with John Lynch the stuff that he said was kind of um par for the course of what everybody's kind of been thinking but the one thing i know they both talked on and, and touched upon was the uh, safety position where you know we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks i think mike silver mentioned this he kind of alluded to this a while back Telano hufanga he's definitely rehabbing well and they have high hopes for him but it's not 100 percent. you know there, there's no guarantee he'll be back 100 percent. the safety position is something we still really need to take a look at and i know they brought in julian blackman uh, to look last week, but Kyle told him it's definitely not necessarily a starting position if you come in this job because they're still not 100% sure on what they're going to get out of Talano Hufunga. So I think the safety position is something I'm like, okay, we, we really got to keep an eye on this. Are they going to draft one? Will they get another veteran? And then, uh, you know, uh, Deshaun Gibson, the door's still open. Will they bring him back? So I thought that was interesting. And then obviously the Brandon Ayuk stuff. Kyle said he spoke with him in Cabo last week. I know Brandon Ayuk went to Mexico because he posted all about it in his social media. But it's interesting to know that Brandon Ayuk was there and Kyle was there. Because we all know Kyle goes to Cabo and he has the Cabo click and all the guys, you know, you know, George Kittle, Kyle Juszczyk, all those guys that go to Cabo. They're usually there together. But it's interesting to note that Brandon Ayuk was there in Cabo with Kyle. So they had a talk. I know. Was that, do you, do you think that was coordinated? How do you both wind up in Cabo San Lucas at the same time? That I seems, was, yeah, that seems coordinated. Have you been to Cabo? I have. It's amazing out there. And is it, you know, is it the kind of thing, would you coordinate with like a brand Nayuk to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to Cabo. I've got a big Niner, uh, you know, YouTube and, and, uh, and Instagram. Hey, how about you going to Cabo at the same time? And we can, we can Cabo it up. I would love to. I, I I would love to coordinate that, but I don't know how you would do that. But um, I don't know if that's the thing you do. It's just head coach, player, both in Cabo at the same time. Maybe Kyle's like, hey, you know, here's, maybe last year he goes, hey, Brennan, next off season, if you ever find yourself in Cabo, keep this number. I might be there. Okay. You know, it, it, it was definitely something I was like, because that was the big, one of the big topics. So I was like, but he said, Cabo. Would you rather stay in a big five star, you know, house and rent a house in Cabo, or would you rather stay at a killer, whatever the greatest resort is in Cabo? Oh, give me the resort. I want the all you can eat. The the give me the works, man. Go give me a resort pool, all that stuff. I mean, the, the nice house would be great, but I want it all. I want people to cater to me. If I'm on vacation, I want to live like. I'm on a vacation and, and people cater to me and you get the room service and all that, all, all inclusive. Give me everything I want when I want it, Larry. Um, there yeah, you that's go. what I was like. I have one more uh, topic that Kyle brought up today. Yeah. I what else? It, was, it wasn't necessarily interesting. We knew, but we got some clarification. Um, the fact that uh, Nick Sorensen, he says Nick Sorensen definitely going to be the primary play caller on defense, but 
game planning. Brandon Staley's going to have a little bit of uh, his hands on the game plans, and he's already helped with free agency. So Brandon Staley's really doing a lot behind the scenes that I don't think people are, are understanding. So I feel Nick Sorensen definitely they're going to get let him be the play caller, but Brandon Staley's got a lot more um, into this than I, I initially expected. He's a really good well, at developing so- game plan. Yeah, I mean, Kyle said that Sorensen will call the plays for the defense, and then when he was asked about Brandon Staley, he he just said that he's not sure what his duties will be. He'll be part of game planning for the defense. But he also said he knows a lot about personnel in the league. So maybe mm-hmm. he's already done his role. Maybe he landed Leonard Floyd. That Maybe that was his role. That was it. That was his role. That's it. You know? That's what he... You never know. I mean, the other thing he said about Sorensen, he said our players love him and they're mm-hmm. used to him. So mm-hmm. maybe that was a major factor, the fact yeah. that the players really like Sorensen and that they're they're used to him. I mean, they don't they the Niners really like what they're doing defensively and don't want to change. I think that that part of it is pretty clear, huh? Yeah, absolutely. There's not a lot of uh, they don't have to do a lot of transitionary movements, and I think that's why Kyle wanted this because he said he was a guy that felt he was close to being ready last year, and now the, the players like him. He knows the system. You're not going to really change much. So I, I get it. It makes sense that they went with him, and I think Kyle was like, okay, he's ready for the move. Boom, let's make the move. And if the players respect him, it makes it easy for everybody. Mark, uh, wait, wait a second. Mark187 says, will the Niners sign Blackman, the safety from India, or Simmons from Denver? Um, I, I, I will say this. I think that we're not talking enough about the safety spot. I mean, look, Hafanga's coming off an injury. Jair Brown was a rookie last year, and they're really, that's it. I mean, Odom is a special teamer. Eric Harris and Taylor Hawkins are more practice squad guys. They really don't have backup safeties. So well, I don't know if it's Malik Mustafa or in the draft or if it's somebody else in the draft. Uh, the Utah safety, I know they looked at him, or if it's a free agent, you know, or maybe both. But they don't have anybody. Like if Hafanga or Brown went down, they really don't have anybody that's starting caliber that they could plug in there. That's pretty bad. They're, they're yeah. pretty thin there. Yeah, and, and that's why I said that was something that I really took away from not just John, uh, not just Kyle Shanahan, but John Lynch. They both really hunkered down on this topic that. You know, they want to add a safety. They're still, I think Lynch mentioned that, hey, you know what, we might add one or two more players. And they both really, uh, we're, we're talking about that safety position. You know, they said they did have Julian Blackman in the visit. They liked what they saw. But I think, again, they're not necessarily sure if they sign someone, he's going to be a starter. So I don't know if they want to pay a guy that has, a you know, a big contract due like Justin Simmons because they're still on the fence with Hufunga. He, we know he's great, but will he be? what he was before the injury. That's a tough injury for a guy like him who needs his lateral abilities and stuff. So tough, tough situation. I, I definitely think they want to make sure they have really good depth for that safety position. Cause like you said, Larry, they really don't have a lot of safety um, uh, depth at the moment. So I think safety is a big position that we really got to keep our eye on. I, I do. The other spot, the other interesting, interesting comment. I thought when, when Kyle was asked about Malik Collins, Mm. And he said, you know, we're pumped to get him. And then he added, he's healthy. I think mm-hmm. that was their big concern inside with, yeah. with Armstead was that they were going to wind up paying him a lot and then he wasn't going to be healthy and they were going to have nowhere to go. So instead they let him go, you know, they bring in Elliot, they bring in Collins and those guys are younger and more than anything, I think they're healthier. I think that's, I think that's really it right there. I mean, are they better at defensive tackle? I don't know if they're better, but they're definitely healthier. They're better in the sense they're going to be available. And if you're not available, what good are you to me, Larry? And I love an Armstead, great guy. Javon Kinlaw, great guy. They're both really good people, but you're not getting anything out of them if they're not playing games and they're on the bench and they're they're hurt, which they had been for you know a lot of times there in the last couple of years. And I'm glad they both got paid and you know found another place to you know continue their career. But I think that was the biggest takeaway I had during this free agency is the 49ers signed durable players. They may not be better than the people they have talent wise, skill wise, but they're going to see the field. And at the end of the day, you're going to get production out of them instead of having to, in the middle of the season, 
go sign some random player that you don't know. Now these guys can go through the system, go through the training camp, and, you know, stick with the team. And, and again, all of these guys. Leonard Floyd, that guy, fantastic signing. He hadn't missed the game in 108 straight games. You know, knock on wood, he continues it. But I think that is the biggest takeaway of this entire free agency class that the 49ers had. They're all very durable. I love it. Yeah. No, I mean, hey, you got you can't make the club in the tub, as they say. Of all <laughs> the free agent additions, which is your favorite? Which is the one that you're like, eh, I don't know. My favorite's Leonard Floyd. I mean, I think we me and you have talked about an edge rusher off the other side of Bosa for for a long time. And I feel like this might be the guy. I know he's 32, but he's still got a lot of juice in him. He's had nine sacks at least a season for the last four years. I love the Leonard Floyd signing. Um, he's worked with, you know, Brandon Staley. So I know he, and again, like you said, maybe Staley knew he would fit the personnel. This guy has a knack to get towards a quarterback. I'm really happy about this guy. Very durable. Because look at the edge rushers they've put on the other side of Bosa. Drake Jackson, he flamed out last year. D Ford, we all know about D Ford and his injury history. Chase Young, apparently he played through a neck injury last year when, you know, he wasn't as consistent. But now looking back at it, it makes a little bit more sense. He had a neck injury. She had surgery last week. Um, and then everybody else is just kind of mid-tier guys. I'm really excited about Leonard Floyd. Um, the guy that I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say I don't. I'm not excited. I just don't know much about him. Yutura Gross Matos. I mean, we'll see. Maybe he could be the next, like, Ebicom type player where he could set the edge really well. That's what I'm expecting out of him. But it didn't really move the needle for me when they signed him. Um, I like uh, the Leonard Floyd for me is just, you know, to me, he's quite a bit better than what they've had. And I, I, I think people are going to understand that, you know, really early on, once you see this guy bend off the edge, explode around the edge, the motor, the get off the moves. Um, I just think he's, I think he's quite a bit better than Randy Gregory or chase, you know, chase young or, um, really D Ford. I, I think Floyd might be the best defensive end piece they've had opposite Bosa uh, since so. Bosa's been here. So I love that one. I also love the Jordan Elliott one. Okay. Um, you know, he's three ten. he's healthy. He can move his feet. He was like the sixth or seventh best defensive tackle against the run last year. Um, I really like Jordan Elliott. I think Jordan Elliott's going to step in and, and, and really surprise some people. As far as the one I didn't love, I'm not a big Devondre Campbell guy. Um, I, th I was hoping they could fill that need more in the draft, but um, Shanahan loves him. So, and has loved him for a while. Yeah. So that's a good thing. But I just, to me, you know, I, I don't know. He's a little bigger. He's a little stiffer than the Niner linebackers have been. I don't think he runs as well. I think there's some opportunity to get some guys in the draft on day three that are better than Devondre Campbell. So I think they kind of spent some money there. They didn't need to spend. I'm not a huge fan of Campbell. What, what do you think of Campbell? I mean, I didn't hate it. I mean, he's kind of hasn't been what he was from a couple years ago. But if you saw his Twitter last week, he went off on the Packers. I think he's coming in with some fire on him because there's a lot of people that do doubt him right now. And a lot of people have that same sentiment and saying, Oh, he may not be the, the fit for the Niners. Honestly, we needed a veteran. You're not going to go break the bank. You know, you have Greenlaw there who hopefully will be back. They said they're going to play it safe on him. They might PUP him, put him on the PUP list to begin the season. So they could play it safe. Campbell. I'm not expecting Campbell to have like a big, impact you know maybe a couple games early on the season until dre's ready to roll but i don't hate it as a veteran signing you know there wasn't too many options at the point when they got to you know um that position when they need to sign someone they have really good young linebackers holland fantastic linebacker coach i think he's going to do a good job of developing them and as you know as you mentioned they can draft players in the um you know draft coming up next month but i, I didn't hate it i think it was a solid veteran guy a guy that's kind of coming in with the chip on his shoulder, ready to prove himself. And again, I expect Greenlaw to come back and be ready to rock and roll at some point. So as long as Campbell could kind of hold it down until he's, um, you know, ready to rock and roll, I, I think we're fine. But I didn't hate it overall. I just know there wasn't a lot of big linebackers left at that point. So, um, and then they had to get one after Kendricks pulled a rope-a-dope on us. So you had to get somebody. <laughs> 
I was actually glad that Hendricks or Kendricks backed out just because he's 32. You're not going to play him at at the mic. You've got Fred Warner. You're going to play him weak side. I like my weak side linebacker to be able to really run. I don't know if he can still run. He's 32. So I, to me, that didn't bother me. All right, let's get to the elephant in the room. There is a huge story on the Niner front that, the Niners have one attitude about it and their fans have a totally different attitude. And that's the offensive line. Um, Shanahan talked about the offensive line today and he basically said that, you know, that he thought that the whole offensive line returning was important. Um, that continuity is really an important aspect of O line play. Then he was asked about McKivitz and he said, he's done a hell of a job at right tackle. He's a leader on the team. Then he was asked about Feliciano, and you could see that he loves Feliciano. He's a solid vet who the guys gravitate towards. He's a hell of a dude is what he said. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to certain Niner fans, the O-line sucks. It's Mm -hmm. awful. And every guy out not named Trent, Trent Williams ought to be looking over his shoulder. If you talk O-line with Lynch or with Shanahan, they speak in glowing terms about Brendel and Feliciano and McKivitz. What, what do you make of that? We have two dramatically different um, accounts of the Niner O line. The guys who run the team seem to feel good about it. The guys who watch the team feel terrible about it. Well, I mean, I think in, it's all in comparison to what you're you're looking at. So obviously, the the coaches like their players they wouldn't want them on their team they're not going to throw them under the bus but at the same time if you see where Brendel came a couple of years to where he is now he's a starting center he was a journeyman so yeah his story's great Colts McKivitt's a fifth round pick they traded Matt Breida uh, a couple of years back to draft him out of West Virginia came a long way he became a starter on their team Feliciano right he became a starter he was this Swiss Army knife guy a solid veteran so do they like those guys absolutely they, there is continuity that is important in an O-line but can they do better than that? Absolutely. And I think all the fans see that. You know, when we watch the games, we see, okay, O-line's getting trucked. The O-line has let up big play, big sacks. You know, Brock didn't get, you know, the time to throw. You look at the analytics. So I see from the fan standpoint, like, yeah, we want to upgrade. We want to have the best offensive line that you can possible. And it's not just replacing these guys because they're solid players, but you can do better. The fact of the matter is Jake Brendel's 32. How long is he going to play center for, right? Trent Williams, he's 36. He's getting close to the end. You need to make sure you have a plan, a contingency plan for him when he's all done. Aaron Banks, great guard. He's been solid. He had a little bit of turf toe last year, but he's in a contract season this year, Larry. He's going to be expensive if he continues to play at the level he has. Um, Feliciano, probably get them uh, one more year. He's a good veteran mentor, like they mentioned. He's nice. I like him. Colton McKivitt's. Is he an elite starting right tackle? No, but to their point, there's really not a lot of people out there in the market right now. So you need to go and get a young stud in the draft. Now, can Colton McKibbitts be a good swing tackle? Absolutely. He's really developed into that point. But as a Niner fan, they see Colton McKibbitts, he's not a starter. So to their point, yeah, go get an elite right tackle. Make him start if he can be that guy. And then if anything happens, Colton McKibbitts could come in and and be that backup swing tackle insurance policy. I think that's what fans want. But if you just go off of what Kyle Shanahan's assessment, Colton McKibbitts, he's he's great. Yeah, compared to where he came in as a fifth-round pick out of West Virginia, it's been a great rise for him to become a starter. But absolutely, Larry, the 49ers need to upgrade that offensive line. Plain and simple. If they're not drafting offensive line that first round, people are going to be pissed. Well, see, that's the thing. I don't know if they're going to do it in the first round. Um, Shanahan said we're we're going to keep looking to add. You, there's the old saying: "You're only as weak as your weakest link." What is the Niners' weakest link on their offensive line? Right tackle, I think. You think so? I, I think, think it's so. Brendel. I think it's Brendel. Okay. To be honest. Okay. Center, like, I got... you know, okay. Brendel to me is, as you said, he's 32. He's not that big. He's not that powerful. He was a street free agent. He wasn't drafted by anybody. Um, he was, and anybody could have had him. They plugged him in. They found a way to make him a Pro Bowl alternate. But I saw the way DJ Reader kind of worked him Aiden. around this year. Aiden, yeah. I, I think, 
I think I think Brendel's the weak link, to be honest. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. If let's just say the first round comes and the Niners keep that 31 pick, they don't trade up, they don't trade down, they're picking at 31. We all want to see them pick a player that can make an impact, not somebody yeah. who may make an impact in three years, somebody who can make an impact right away. So that being said, who is the who is the plug and play player that the 49ers that you want to see the 49ers draft at 31? See, and plug that's and the play problem. player. That's the problem there. At 31, I want them to get a plug and play right tackle or whatever center, whatever to, a premium offensive, like a guy that you know when you plug him into this lineup, he's gonna be a perennial starter, maybe a pro bowler eventually. Like you want that kind of impact from alignment. But at 31, you may not get that. So you're right. In, in a sense, they got to go best player available. But in my in my thing is, if you stay at 31, you might not, you're, you're not going to get a plug and play starting tackle right away. I don't think so. Because by that point, all the top dogs are going to be drafted. And unless someone slips, like Mims might slip, I, you know, he might. But if I'm the 49ers, I'm not sticking at 31. I'm trading up. I'm trading up. I got 10 draft picks. I pretty much filled most of my holes. I, I have a squad that I'm pretty much returning with mo the core players. Your quarterback's back. You know, you just got to figure out the situation. Who are you trading up for? Top 15, top 20 pick, whatever, so I can get a plug-and-play offensive lineman, right tackle. Because Colton McKivitz would be a great sixth lineman. I just don't think he's the starting center. Or, or right Who's tackle. Who's your target? And, and, Who do you want? Oh, man. I mean, there's so many of them. There's the, the, Mims. I mean, probably, Joe Alt. You know, Joe Alt. They say is going Joel. top. You're not top getting five. Joe Alt. You're not getting. Bishanu, Joel. They say is going top ten. Buwaga's okay. going top twelve. Latham's okay. going top twenty. Mims is going top twenty five. You got go Mims. going top thirty five. Maybe Mims. Maybe that's the guy. Maybe that's the guy. He's only made eight starts. Does that concern you? No, it doesn't. He's a raw talent, and I think that's what you, you got to take a gamble sometimes. And I think if that's what you feel could be a a star on your team, you got to do it. And then you can get a center. Like, they do need to replace Brendel eventually. I think you could get a center in the third round. That could be a starting center. And you give Brendel one more year. Because Nick Zakel, I don't think he's the guy. They wanted him to be the guy. I don't think he's the guy. I'll tell you, if I um, were drafting for them, the you know just just going by the this draft tech board, if Tyler Guyton is the top tackle, okay. So then I'm looking at okay, what else? Who else could I get if I if I don't go Tyler Guyton? Um, I I'll, I'll say this since I think Brendel is the problem spot. They got mm -hmm. Jackson Powers Johnson going 29, mm -hmm. and they have Graham Barton going 47. Oh, they have Zach Barton. Frazier going 54. And to me, the Zach Frazier film is overpowering. I mean, he's okay. just a monster. Okay. So I think I, like I think if it was me and I'm at 31 and I'm looking for a plug-and-play player, I'm probably looking for Zach Frazier and starting him over Brendel week one. Wow. I'm so going, you upgrade I'm going, the center. I'm going powerhouse center okay. with a guy that I think is a dominating player. I don't hate it, but I'm still worried about my right side of the line. I hear you, but, or if I don't go there, I, I might go Rook Aurora Aurora from Clemson just because he's just such a monster tackle. Um, and then I'll tell you the guy that I'm really hot on this week is Michael Hall uh, okay. from Ohio state. I don't know. Have you seen Michael Hall? Yeah. I saw um, a little bit of his, uh, his stuff. He's looking good. I mean, he ran four, seven, six at 300 pounds. That's pretty nasty. Too. <laughs> that's crazy. Actually, you know, I mean that that that's a guy who could really help. I mean, you're talking about a 300 pound guy who can run that well. Um, I don't see an edge rusher there unless Latu falls to them. What do you think mm -hmm. that could be? Something. I mean, Latu's had a lot of injury problems from UCLA. He's they're saying he's going 15 to 18, but he could fall. He could fall half okay. a round. He's six five, two sixty, edge rusher. That what do you think of the edge fall. rusher? If I'm going edge rusher and I stick at 31, I hope, which I don't think is going to happen, I hope Chop Robinson falls to the Niners at 31. I, I would love to get Chop, big Chop Rob. That's the guy I would like at 31, but I don't know if he's going to drop that far. 
he had a great workout. He did. He had an incredible workout. Um, what about wide receiver? Where are you with wide receiver? Because, you know, Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, those guys are going to be gone. They're going to be gone. You never know. Um, Brian Thomas Jr. might be there. Might be Adonai there. Mitchell is a really good receiver. He may be there. Xavier Worthy, who ran 4 2, could be there. Um, you know who Malachi, I like? Malachi Corley. Supposedly, I was just going to say the his Niners, name. Was... Niners had a huge contingent that went out to Western Kentucky to watch mm-hmm. Malachi Corley. Maybe you trade back a couple spots and take him. He, I'm looking at his board at somewhere between 60 and 75. But if you want him in the 40s, you could trade back 10 spots, get a few more picks, and take him. What do you think of Corley? I think that they – I just was about to mention, because today Mike Garofalo said that the 49ers um, will have a top 30 pre-draft visit with him. And if you've watched this tape, which I'm sure you have, he looks like Debo Samuel. And we all know next they might might be able to replace Debo with the next Debo. He's like the yak. They call him the yak king in college. That's literally what Debo Samuel is, the yak king. So honestly, if the 49ers want a wide receiver, Malachi Corley is the four, He is the definition of a 49er receiver right here. He's got all the tools it takes. Um, oh man, I would love to get Malachi Corley on this team. This guy is a fantastic wide receiver, especially in the 49ers offense. And with the new punt, you know, kickoff rule, this guy would probably be a, a hell of a return man for the 49ers in his rookie season. And then next year, you can do what you need to do with Debo, and this is your next guy. I, I don't know. I think Malachi would make sense. You know, one of the interesting parts of the Shanahan discussion today was that he said it's huge to have, you know, for Purdy to have a connection mm-hmm. like he right. has with Ayuk, right? And you can see it. Ayuk in the middle of the field um, and Purdy, they've got, you know, he feels very confident going to Ayuk in the middle of the field. He knows Ayuk's not going to turn down hits. He knows he's going to be where he needs to be, so on and so forth. Then Kyle said he ran into Ayuk in Cabo last week, and hopefully they'll get a deal done, and that's what he was kind of echoing. And then he said, um, as far as the Ayuk talks, he said, you know, be patient. Let it work itself out. Um, and then he talked about his relationship with Ayuk. He's like, it's good so far. What What do you make of all the interest in Ayuk and all the talk, it seems like, and, and their plan. I mean, they're going to wait until after the free agent period has been set. Doesn't that kind of favor Ayuk and, and whatever dollars he's going to get? Because isn't that market going to set itself pretty high? And then is it, you know, what do you think of their plan to sign Ayuk? What do you think of their, their, all their talk about, we love Ayuk. But then they're also, you know, talking to other guys who could go in the middle of the first round, like Taliesi Fuaga, like J.C. Latham, like Brian Thomas. And it makes you wonder, are they kind of preparing themselves for Ayuk's departure? And it's like I'm the more I read from them, every, everything I read from the Niners sounds like they love Ayuk. But everything I read from Ayuk sounds like he would love to move on. What, what do you, what's your read on the whole situation? I mean, I think they do love him. Um, and I think at some point, you got to understand it's also a business. And they're going to have people calling. There's going to be people interested. But John Lynch said the same thing this week that he said during the combine. They want to make sure that Brandon Ayuk is here with the Niners for a long time. He's a guy that they love. They are going to prioritize him. And John Lynch has said it. Kyle Shanahan has said it. They say it every year. It's the same thing that happens every single year. But just because you have this premium player doesn't mean you can't look at other people in the draft. You at least want to scout. You want to see what's available. Uh, you look at the free agency market. You look at everything. In the GM, coach, whatever the case is, you look at every option because you don't know how you're going to be able to make your team better. You look at everything. Um, in terms of this whole Brandon and I, the interest, the social media stuff, and this and that, the back and forth, it's par for the course. We see it every single year. This is normal. I think it's just the same you know, song and dance. Um, it's kind of funny because we used to have quarterback drama. Now we have wide receiver drama uh, over the last couple of years. You know, Debo did this same thing. A lot of receivers go through this. They they kind of pull the uh, the social media strings, and I, I don't take nothing of it. You know, I just know that this is the way it works, and 
the 49ers, they have their process. They go through it every single year. John Lynch said, you know, we have a good track record. And if you really think about it, they do. Obviously, the one that they messed up that everybody gives them flack for was Defoe. But other than that, if you really look at this situation, the 49ers do a hell of a job with John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan and getting their players. And what did we say earlier when we opened this show, Larry? We said when they draft a player, develop a player, they typically pay a player. So that is the um, process. That is their their way. That is typically how it goes. But no player is above the front office, above their method. So yeah, guess what? Nick Bosa had to wait until training camp last year. If they made Nick Bosa wait, you think Brandon Ayuk doesn't have to wait? Nobody, no, Nick Bosa, the defensive player of the year, had to wait to get his contract. So like Kyle said, you got to have patience, Larry. Nick freaking Bosa had to wait that long. You think Brandon Ayuk's better than Nick Bosa in this situation? No player is above the team. They got to wait, be patient. But I think that Brandon Ayuk, he'll get what he deserves. Last month, his um, projected value is 23 month. Now, it's at least 24 and a half. So yeah, you're right. The market went up. So for him, if he just sits patient and um, let lets everything happen and, and it plays out, he'll get the money he wants. It's just, you got to be patient. One of the lines that we'll finish with here that I, I caught today from Shanahan, I thought was interesting. I don't know if you heard the whole thing, but he said at one point, running backs are the most important players on the field. Ooh, I love it. Did you hear him say that? I didn't catch that, but he did. He did. He really say that today? Yeah, he said running backs are the most important players on the field. Um, and I understand why he would say that. He's got kind of a run first play action pass mm-hmm. game. You know, he's got kind of a let's establish the run kind of a mindset. Everything seems to be predicated off the run. Correct. Um, they also do a nice job at finding running backs. They have done a really nice job consistently finding day three running backs. Yeah. I ask this because the more I look at the draft, And the more I look at players, the one thing I see with Detroit and Brad Holmes is they target like players they really love. Right. And then they go after those players. And it's not like, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we're looking for a running back and we'll take the best player on the board. No, it's like we love this college running back and um, his name is Jameer Gibbs. And so we're going to go get a pick that we know we can get Jameer Gibbs with, and we're just going to draft Jameer Gibbs. And then watching Detroit this year, I mean, they, they, they have some incredible talent. I mean, you know, I mean, um, Frank Ragnow, uh, Panay Sewell, Sam Laporta, um, Jameer Gibbs, uh, Amon Ra, St. Brown, Brian Branch. I mean, um, you know, Aiden Hutchinson, they've got, some hand-picked awesome players. Yeah. And I love that approach of going into the draft saying, you know what, instead of just playing the board for value and being like, well, we like everybody and we need a running back and we, you know, we'll go with the value pick. How about finding guys that you're just like your scouts are super in love with that your scouts are like, this is the guy. And the reason I, I bring that up, is that the more I watch the draft prospects, the more I think that I'd like to see the Niners unbelievably draft a running back. Um, and I know they've got, I know they got CMC and I know they've got Elijah Mitchell and I know they got JP Mason and I know those guys didn't even play last year, yeah. but the Michigan running back to me, mm. Blake Corum is so special. Could you imagine? Um, he's, he's just a tremendous player. He's got heart. He's got quickness. He can catch it. He can run between tackles. He's short, but he's not small. He's five, seven, two fifteen. you know, 215 pounds on that five, seven frame. He's just really damn good. I, I see kind of, um, I don't want to say it's Emmett Smith, but I see a great running back. I, I see somebody who's far greater than like the rest of these running backs on the board, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, Bucky Irving, Will Shipley, Braylon Allen, Audric Estime, Marshawn Lloyd, you know, really the entire group of the entire class of runners until, you know, there's some good ones late, but um, 
I don't I, I think Blake Corum is a phenomenal get. And yeah. even though they have CMC, if you could find a way to get Blake Corum in the third round, I oh, would do man. It. I you know I Kyle loves it. Kyle loves his running backs. He won for taking running back in the third round. I, I wouldn't be surprised if and Blake Corum is a step above most of those running backs. I saw him play a lot. I saw a lot of Michigan football. I've been to many games. I watched him in, you know, the Rose Bowl. This guy is just a fantastic play. This guy is so good. He, in Kyle Shanahan's system, because you're right, he loves the running backs. His offense is predicated by the run game. Be fantastic. He'd be a nasty one-two punch with Christian McCaffrey. And then when Christian McCaffrey gets a little older, got a good running back there. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, as much as I love Elijah Mitchell, we need a guy that can actually be durable and make it through the weeks. And this guy was a a bruiser for Harbaugh, and they ran the ball so many times out there in Michigan. So a run-heavy offense in Michigan, he'd come to a run-heavy team with the Niners. I'd be a fantastic pick, Larry. Um, give me CMC and Blake Corum every day of the week. Oh, my God, that'd be nasty, man. Dude, Corum, something about Corum says to me, Emmett, and if, yeah. if you could draft a great running back, I mean, let's just be honest about it. Do you want to draft a certain position? You want to fill your needs. Of course you do. Course. But if you could find a great player, I'll take a great player at any position Absolutely. over a good player that fills a need. Yeah. Because you win best, with your great players. Best player available. Sometimes that's the, if he's the best player available and you don't necessarily need to fill that need and – because sometimes you you force feed a pick just because it's a need, and then you kind of reach. If if you, if you can just get the best player, sometimes I think it's a better. Way. And he's a he's going to be a fantastic player. Imagine him, a player that good on your team. You figure a way to get him the ball. You figure a way. No doubt. Two last ones, and then we'll jet. Um, last weekend, since we last talked, um, Legarius Sneed got traded to the Titans, and yeah. Raj. This one really shocked me Did because it? I got into it the other night with Vish and Jesse about Sertan oh. and they were, you know, they were both like, you know, it's going to cost you multiple ones to get Sertan. And I'm like, I don't think so, man. They're going to have to pay him. Um, um, you know, at the end of the year, he's a free agent. And then, sh and then, you know, they were going off of, Hey, it sounds like Legarius Sneed's going to get at least a two and maybe something more. Well, I don't know if you saw that trade, but Legarius mm -hmm. Sneed went for a seventh round pick this year and a second round pick next year. So the third, Chiefs is aren't third even round. Third or is round. It third round. Third like round. Third next rounder year. with the seventh round pick flop, pick swap. Yeah. Yeah. So seventh this year, though. Third next year. Yeah. What, is there a price tag? I know, you know, I think I've thrown this to you and I've thrown this to other people. Hey, I, I like to me, Sertan makes a lot of sense for the Niners right now. Why? Because they're in their Super Bowl window. Uh, they just got beat by a Chiefs team that had awesome coverage corners. Um, Ambry Thomas is their third corner, their fourth corner is is even less reliable. Um, I I would be interested in Sertan, but if I would be really interested in Sertan, if the price tag is like a two and a six or something like yeah, that, yeah. Um, does the, does the Sneed trade make you think that maybe Sertan is gettable on draft day for the Niners? The thing with the Sneed pick is, and everybody was like flipping out. Like you say, you were flipping out over the, the draft value. I wasn't because at the end of the day, you you hit the nail in the head, Larry. They had to pay him. They paid him a big. Did you see his contract? He got paid a lot of money. Look yeah. up his contract. He got paid a lot of M's in that bank account, Larry. So the point of that whole trade was the Chiefs weren't going to find anybody that were going to give up more value because they knew whoever was taking them had to pay that big contract. So a third and a seventh pick flop for them, that's the best they can get because they had to find someone that was going to pay him the money he wanted. And that's the reason why they couldn't keep LeJerry Sneed because he wanted to get paid. Like he wasn't going to play on that franchise tag. He wanted the money. Show me the money, Jerry Maguire, right? Money talks, bullshit walks, right? That's basically what it was. And at the end of the day, I don't think that was a bad deal for the Chiefs because they weren't going to keep a guy happy. They needed to find a team that could absorb that and pay him. And guess what? The Titans, we think the Titans make the playoffs, Larry. No, he's already happy. He won a Super Bowl championship. So he gets his ring and now he goes, 
gets his bag and he could be a star player on a on a up and coming team or whatever the case is. So everybody's happy. And you know the Chiefs, they're gonna take that damn pick someday and he'll be a good player. It's Andy Reid. I don't think it was that bad of a deal, but it's amazing Patriots, though that they moved uh, that good of a player. I know they in did. their Super Bowl window they when they're did. going for three in a row. Um yeah. That was for, I know. For, that was crazy. for as little as they got a seventh this year. I mean, a third and a seventh is bad, but as long as the third was this year. Yeah, that was the surprise part, that it was not this year. I was like, wow, they're not even going to replace them this year. That right. was the big, that definitely was. Uh, that was the, the part that surprised me was, okay, they got the third. I knew they weren't going to get that much because, again, somebody has to pay that price. To me, I was like, damn, they didn't even get anything this year except the pick flop. So I think they just realized we could we couldn't pay them. This team can pay them what the Titan. What's it? What is it to give them to the Titans? Because if they would have gave them to like the Bills or someone that's like a real threat to them, then yeah, it would have been like, oh God, how that hurt, right? Well, there was yeah, there was no chance that Kansas City was going to trade Snead to the Niners. No, no, no I mean no, not at Fred Beach. No, no, he's not. He's smarter than not. that. Yeah, yeah. Mitchell and Ness says Greg Newsom seems more realistic. Mm. I wouldn't mind Greg Newsom. I'd take Greg Newsom it. right now. I'll take him for a Cleveland. fourth and a pick swap. Seventh. Take yeah. him. Let's have yeah. him. Uh, last question. Josh Dobbs. We talked, uh, touched on it last week, I believe. Yeah. There's a lot of people talking about Josh Dobbs. Some people really love him. Other people really don't. Is Josh Dobbs, in your mind, an upgrade over Sam Darnold? I think so. He's young. He's got some mobility to him. He's a backup quarterback. Again, I don't want my backup quarterback in the game, Larry, but I do think he is an upgrade because he's still a player I feel like could get a little better. With Sam Darnold, we knew with Sam Darnold. Like Sam Darnold is the guy who we thought he was. I'm not saying he was you know, atrocious, but you know what you're getting out of Sam Darnold. I think you could squeeze a little bit more out of Dobbs than you could out of Sam Darnold. And he's a smart guy. He's an astronaut, man. So, yeah, I think to answer your question, I think he's a little bit of an upgrade over Sam Darnold. I, I do, too. I, I, I'm i not a big Darnold guy. Um, I think Dobbs potentially can can be a – maybe could even be the Niners' backup for more than j just this year. You know, he yeah. could be here for two, three years down the line. What do you got cooking this week, Raj? If people are checking you out um, on your IG or on 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 uh, on YouTube, what are you cooking with this week? What do you got going? I'll just yeah, same old, same old. Just trying to post the news that we usually have. I'll be live maybe once or twice this week, but just trying to focus on some work. And over the weekend, last week, I took a little bit of a, a break. You know, it's good to go on some social media breaks. It's the off season. You know, taking care of my mental health and also, you know, we got some. There's a lot of things to do in the in the off season. I like to go and get out. You know, spring break's coming up, so uh, me and my daughter got some plans going on for that. There's some movies coming up, so I'll go see some movies. But I mean, I'll still be posting as much as I can. But yeah, I'm gonna take it a little bit easier this week. But I do need everybody to go vote for me on the March Mania bracket. That's right. We'll hit that one more, one more time before we get out of here. But um, this kind of caught me in the chat here, and let me see if I can find this one i call this one up here somebody said that chicago or that uh, nick wright is saying that the niners want to make a move for somebody named williams who's williams for chicago really i didn't see this did you see that somebody said nick oh yeah here, so here it is uh blood moon says what is nick wright smoking saying the niners trade with chicago for williams Who's oh caleb williams? williams i don't know. Oh, oh come on come that's, on that's that's nick wright being nick wrong nick Wright. come on nick Wright. that's all you need to know nick wright come on niners aren't getting nick come, on. come on come ah, on that's crazy talk do you even do you are you a fan of uh caleb williams i mean i don't know who no, the hell is gonna be good I, don't, I mean, I, to I be honest, I, I don't know. If you said to me, you know what I heard today? I heard today that um, the Commanders may take J.J. McCarthy second I overall. I saw that report. I saw that. I think it's smoke, but um, I don't know. I'm not a Caleb guy. I just think I saw him play, and he just always crushed in the big moment in, like, adversity situations, and he kind of he, – he had an arrogance to him, which I guess you need as a quarterback, but I, I just – he rubbed me the wrong way sometimes. 
And he's coming into a big pressure cooker situation with Chicago. Like he, I know everybody's like, oh, he's got a good setup. They're grading all these players for him. Brian Poles is setting him up. I think it's going to be a – because everybody expects him to be great now. And it, I don't know. I just – I didn't see him do well against adversity, you know, last year when he was with USC. And I don't, I don't have high hopes for him. But, hey, hopefully he proves me wrong. JJ, I watched a lot. Great player, but number two player, number two in the draft. I think that's a stretch for him. He's a great player. He's a great person, though. Something tells me Caleb Williams is not going to be special. I'm not no, sure what, not. but um, it, he makes me nervous um, yeah. watching him. And just uh, there's something. It's like people say, oh, he's he's one of the greatest quarterback prospects to ever come down the pike. They say and that like, to everybody. I don't know if I see that. I don't That's either. Cool. I don't think I see that. Uh, last super from Amar Singh. He says, Larry, how would you feel about Newbin, uh, the safety, or DeGene, the Iowa corner at 31? Um, Newbin, probably that would be, a, I would say, 20, 25 picks early. I would trade. If you wanted if you wanted Newbin and you wanted to trade back, okay, I could see that. Um, and as far as DeGene, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think he's a true corner. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know. I'd have, I'd have to really be convinced that he could play man to man in the NFL. You yeah. Know, but he, he's definitely got, he's definitely a, a, a good productive football player in college and he definitely had good workout numbers. So, I mean, you've got the workout numbers and you got the tape to me. Typically that's when you draft guys, when you have both workout numbers and tape, but mm-hmm. um, I'd be a little concerned about Dejean. What do you think? Have you seen him at all? The Iowa corner? Yeah, I like what I've seen out of him, but I don't know if you take him at 31. I'm, I'm I'm not taking any of those guys at 31, honestly, but they're both talented. I just yeah. wouldn't take him at 31. Larry, I got one question for you. You yeah. saw the rule changes, to, you know, over this last couple of weeks, the last couple of days. Two rule changes, the big ones. No hip drop tackle. What's your thoughts on no hip drop? And then the other one. The new kickoff role. You see the new kickoff? A little interesting. Yeah, what do you think the about kickoff those two? Rule seems complicated to me. Yeah. Um, it seems like they're just they know that it's a dangerous play. They know they don't want the dangerous play. They know that they don't want a useless play. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what do you do? Do you make it dangerous? Do you make it useful? Do you, you know? So I kind of feel like they're caught in between there. As far mm-hmm. as the hip drop tackle, I I don't like it from the standpoint yeah. of it's it there's it's an injury. I mean, Jimmy Ward took out Tony Pollard in yeah. Niners Cowboys two years ago in the playoffs with that play. It helped the Niners win the game. But I don't like that. I don't want to see guys, you know, basically there's no way to avoid the injury. If you're the back or you're the receiver, you're the tight end, somebody goes and grabs you and then they can swing their legs at your a kill at your knees yeah i don't know it seems dirty but there's also so many rules changes raj that favor the offense mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. how is a big how is a how's a corner supposed to tackle derrick henry I, it's not fair cmc debo like i was reading a report this weekend and it was right before the meetings and i was like oh there's gonna be a lot of rule changes and the report said that the nfl is not happy with the way the scoring has kind of dipped over the last couple of years and they want to tinker with, and that's why I knew I was like, Oh, there's gonna be a lot of rules. I guess the scoring has basically dipped like a touchdown over the last couple of years. So they want that scoring up because at the end of the day, more points on the board, more tickets sold. People want to see offense, more fantasy. More more fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like back in the day, Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin had a commercial. I don't know if you remember chicks dig the long ball, Larry. Yeah. In, in NFL. Chicks dig the touchdowns, Larry. Well, you know what? It means money. Yeah. Offensive you know, points mean money. Money is what they're about. They're in business to make money. So, um, but I, I guess I like it because it's safer for the players and I'm all about the player's safety. But I just am thinking of like Sam Womack trying to tackle, you know, a 235 <laughs> pound back. How yeah. do you do it? You, you hold on. He's still running. How do you bring him to the ground if you can't swing your legs and body at his legs and try to get him down? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah, a very it's, so tough, it's, it's a tough. It's a tough. It's a tough uh, world out there for corners trying to no, try to big backs. 
You're right. And and the, it's so funny you said that about like, you know, trying to hang out. Jimmy Ward posted a picture that day on his Instagram where he's this guy's like hanging on for dear life, trying to take down this big guy. And he's like, this is this is going to be me. It was so it was like a meme he posted. But he's like, Jimmy, this like scrawny guy holding on to this big hulkster of a guy. And he's like holding on for dear life. And the guy's just like dragging the this tiny guy. So it's, it's what's going to happen. I mean, I saw Richard Sherman say it. He's like, man, how do little corners, you know, bring down 240 pound backs? I mean, it's going to be, you're going to need help. You're going to need help. You're going to have to bring more hats. You're going to have to bring your friends. Gang tackles. Yeah. Um, All right. That does it for us. Um, Let's remind everyone to vote. If they haven't voted for Raj and myself, the link is in the description. Raj, have a great rest of your week. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Thanks to all of our our chatters and vote for Raj. Vote for me. Have a great day. Go Niners. Yeah, never met a man. I've been scared of. Careful. You won't get